Okay, very good. So um, our next talk will be by Vadim Gorin from uh, University of Wisconsin. Welcome. And he will talk about, uh, ah, you didn't put the title, I mean, so this okay. puts me in a difficult position. Okay. So these are loss and silence via dynamic loop equations, please. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank organizers for running this beautiful workshop, Philippe and all others. Thank you very much for bringing us all to Florence. Uh, so my talk will be about uh, random tilings. And while I will be speaking about some recent developments, but if you want to learn about like older developments, that was my kind of COVID projects, the book which I started before COVID, but then managed to finish over the COVID and has uh, all the background if you become interested. Okay, so now coming to my talk. So lozenge tiling and dynamic loop equations. So the talk will contain two parts. First, I will try to present something which will be called dynamic loop equation, which is some equation for very general Markov chains. And then I will apply it in the second part to lozenge tilings to obtain some new results describing their asymptotic behavior. Okay, so let's start with this part about dynamic loop equation. What is that? So there is a result about general Markov chain with interactions of random matrix type. So the Markov chain will be discrete. So both discrete time and discrete space. It's not showing up there, right? So uh, you have N tuples of integers in your Markov chain, lambda one, lambda two, up to lambda N, all integers. Now, there will be a real parameter theta in description of this Markov chain. Uh, you should think about it as a positive real number. And we will write all transition probabilities in terms of the coordinates lambda i minus i theta. Now, if theta is uh, equal to one, then there is a very innocent shift. What it says is just, you know, weakly ordered integers turn into strictly ordered integers, but we also allow theta to be arbitrary real number like square root of two, and then it becomes something more complicated. Now, transition probabilities of our Markov chain are as follows. So uh, the transition probability depend on parameters. So there is a three functions which enter into the formula. There is a function B, function phi plus, and function phi minus. And the allowed transitions, uh, two to the n allowed transitions. So each of the coordinates, each of the lambdas, you can add one to it or not add one to it. So there's two to the n options here. And this is a, you know, there is a probability which you assign to this option. There is something which, you know, looks a little bit like a Vandermont, but in this uh, shift in this coordinate changed by Bs. So this is one Vandermont in, in denominator, another Vandermont in numerator. So that's a general form that depends on three arbitrary functions, B, phi plus, and phi minus. Okay, so you might be wondering where do these things appear? So here is the simplest possible case I know, which is about non-resecting independent random walks. <coughs> so for this model, non-resecting random walks, so you, what you choose, well, you start with just independent random walks in which each walker at each time moment either stays put with probability one minus P or jumps one step step up with probability P. So here's one possible trajectory. Now you start them at arbitrary initial configuration and you assume that they're independent, but then you create interaction here by conditioning these random walks to have no intersections. So formally speaking, you first condition to have no intersection from time zero up to time large T, but then you can send T to infinity and there's a well-defined limit or there's a Markov chain of these non-intersection independent random walks. You can compute transition probabilities of this Markov chain that will be given exactly in this form, but with many simplifications like theta parameter will be one. The function B of X will just essentially disappear. B of X is equal to B X. And the functions phi plus and phi minus, well, they'll be just constants, P and one minus P. So note that in this formula, what's happening is that, you know, phi plus is raised to the power E I, phi minus is raised to the power one minus E I, which means that whenever, you know, the ith coordinate grows, phi plus factor, factor appear. Whenever i, I coordinate does not grow, then phi minus factor appears. So these factors kind of control background and if you want how, how your independent walkers are moving. Okay, what do we have about this very general interactive Markov chain, which depends on one real parameter and three arbitrary functions. So here is an equation which we have for this Markov chain. So it's written here. So if we assume that our 
parameters of this Markov chain were holomorphic functions, B phi plus plus minus or holomorphic, then the following expectation in this model is also holomorphic function. So what is the expectation here? So the randomness comes from this uh, configuration, from these EIs, that's where the randomness from. So the non-trivial uh, part of the observable is this part, there is one product and there is another product. So they're obviously random. You combine them with this coefficients phi plus and phi minus, you take expectations. So you sum overall configurations with weights given by these transition probabilities of your Markov chain. <coughs> Now, in what sense is it an equation? So this is just a statement that this thing is holomorphic. Well, it is an equation in the sense that what it says is that, well, a priori, these expressions, they have many poles just because of the denominators. So what the equation is saying is that these poles precisely cancel out, and then there are no poles. So there is this some symmetry in the model, if you want, which leads to the cancellation of these things. Okay, now this equation, you know, we call it dynamical loop equation, and it is a relative of, you know, family of equations. Some of them are called Dyson Schwinger equations, sometimes they're called Nikrasov equations, sometimes loop equations for uh, beta ensembles of eigenvalues of random matrices, and some discretizations of that. That is kind of a new relative of this family of various equations. Now, for us, this equation, the fact that this expectation is holomorphic, will be a basic building block for developing asymptotic behavior. And I want to give you a vague analogy, well, very vague at this point, that you know it's unclear why this, the fact that it is holomorphic has some anything to do with asymptotics at this point, right? And similarly, you know, when we think about maybe vertex models, you know, analysis usually starts with young Baxter equation. At first, it's unclear why young Baxter equation has anything to do with asymptotic, but somehow eventually that is helpful. And similarly here, so we'll have this, you know, basic building block, this equation from, we, from this building block will be able to produce interesting asymptotic results. Now, I mentioned the name of Baxter here, and it's not a coincidence. So, there is some relation of this equation to what Baxter was doing for the vertex model. It is not something that we understand fully at this point. So there are some formulas in Baxter's book, something that he is called TQ relation, which looks somewhat similar. So, you know, there is something which is holomorphic there in those formulas. Now, direct connection is unclear at this point. So we don't know how to connect it directly, but uh, you know, if you look at the historically, then those formulas motivated many developments eventually leading to these formulas. And we are still trying to understand it better. And maybe that will lead us to generalization of these formulas to more classes of vertex models, but you know, it is what it is now. Now, for what models can we apply these formulas at this point? So what interesting models will have transition probabilities of this type? So here is very far from being complete, but here's some list of you know, models for which you can use it. So I already mentioned non-resecting Bernoulli random walks. You can also get non-resecting condition imposed on Poisson random walks, it will work. You can get some continuous scaling limit from that. So there is a discrete Markov chain, but there is a continuous scaling limit which will turn into these discrete time, discrete space Markov chain into continuous time, continuous space Markov chain. And one of these Markov chains which you can get obtained through limit transition will be Dyson Brownian motion, which we heard about in our previous talk. So you can get general parameters beta, which in random matrices is usually beta one, two, and four. This corresponds to real complex quaternionic matrices. You can get all of those by, by playing with the parameter theta. So that's why it's important for these formulas. So what we will be speaking mostly in this talk today, application of this formula to random Lozenge tilings, and you can also apply them to random domino tilings if you want. You can also, apply these formulas to the study of corners process of self-adjoint random matrices, meaning that you take a self-adjoint matrix and you look at the joint distribution of eigenvalues of this matrix and then principal corners, eigenvalues of these corners, this kind of again, you can think about this as having a Markov chain structure and it will correspond to these transition probabilities. Or if you more like a lover of uh, symmetric polynomials, then, you know, process is created out of the McDonald and Kurt-Wiener polynomials that special principal specialization, they will all have this Markov chain structure with this type of transition probabilities. Okay, so there is a variety of things where you can apply it. You know, I'm not able to speak about all of these applications today, so I need to choose something. So I'm speaking about random Lozenge tilings and how to apply you know, this equation to them. 
Okay, so now we restart. Now that's that's my my application starts. So you can forget about equation for now, or maybe you have question about it. Maybe any questions about the equation for now? Okay, if no question, then you can forget about it for now. So now I will be just explaining to you some probability model which we'll be able to analyze by using this equation. <clears throat> so we'll be dealing with laws and stylings, which means that we draw a polygon on the triangle on the on the grid and we tile it with the lozenges, which are just unions of two uh, adjacent triangles on the grid. So there'll be finitely many lozenges, and we will introduce some uh, finitely many. Laws and stylings of this planar domain, we will introduce some probability measure on that, and then we'll study its, its behavior as the domain becomes large. What? Yeah, the tiles are a little bit too large to make it more precise, to make it clearer to see. I agree, I agree, I agree. So here they become a little bit smaller. So they're, 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 these are the tiles of appropriate sizes now. <clears throat> so, Right, so now you have these tiles of three colors, red, green, and blue. You tile the domain of the type on the left. There is one possible tiling. Now, in our talk, we will be often uh, thinking about tilings in terms of their height functions. So uh, in other words, we will treat this tiling as a projection of a stepped surface in three-dimensional space. So you can skew your head in several ways and see several stepped surfaces here. So my way of skewing my head is to think about, uh, well, you think about the green and blue lozenges here as forming kind of horizontal slice of your surface, uh, uh, maybe of three-dimensional body. You know, you think about maybe pile of cubes. Now you look at the horizontal slice on the height one, that is given by this level of green and blue. Then you look at the height two, it is this uh, level of green and blue, etc. So altogether, you know, the laws and stylings corresponds to a projection of certain surface. In other words, you can create a certain height function to describe this laws and styling. And formal definition of this height function will be that for any point on the plane, you say that the value of the height function is just number of uh, green or blue lozenges directly below it. So if you think about it in terms of this path formed by a blue and green lozenges, then you just count how many of these paths are below your point. So here, you know, for the points in this part, there is precisely one path below, for points below in this part, there are two paths below, etc. So in this way, you know, tiling is the same as this, you know, discrete function having the values one, two, three, etc. Okay, so these are the type of tilings that we want to study. Now, uniformly random laws and stylings are somewhat well understood by now. It's asymptotic phenomenology. You take, you know, large domain and you tile with small tiles. And we know a lot about what's, what should be happening there. And this is not the topic of my talk today. So instead, I will try to describe to you what's happening with the certain cases of non-uniform and moreover inhomogeneous measures on these tilings. Okay, so you might ask why? Why should you study these you know, non-uniform or homogeneous uh, cases? So I personally had two types of motivations. Uh, a priori motivation for me was that, okay, we know lots of asymptotic phenomenology about these uniform tilings. I wanted to understand what parts of this phenomenology they really depend on the fact that we deal with uniform measure and what parts only depend on tilings. So that you know what parts will extend to these inhomogeneous cases, which I want to discuss. <clears throat> well, a posteriori, you know, we will see that the weights which I will consider will turn out to be very, very much integrable. They will have many beautiful structures and many connections with uh, you know conformal invariants, with some algebraic curves, with some combinatorics of Kurwinder polynomials. So a posteriori, we discover a new bunch of interesting you know integrability there. So these are two motivations there. Now, when I speak about non-uniformity, I want to emphasize that there are several ways how you can think about non-uniformity here. One popular way in the literature, which we already heard in some of the previous talks, is to introduce some periodic structure there. So maybe your tiles will still have local weights which change periodically as you move around the picture. But that is not the type of thing that I want to discuss today. Instead, I want to really have true inhomogeneity where something would be changing when you move around the picture. <clears throat> okay, now 
let's go to the definition. What exactly is a random tiling model that I want to discuss here? First of all, the domain. The domain, the domain that we will study will be called trapezoids. So these domains, they live in a vertical strip. And on the right side of the vertical strip, they will have uh, one side, size say of length n. The, v, the strip itself has width large t. And on the left side of this strip, you're allowed to have arbitrary many vertical segments, maybe r of those, which are parameterized by the endpoints. So the first segment is from a1 to a, a, b1, the second segment from a2, b2, then a3, b3, et cetera. So you're getting this kind of domain, which has r vertical segments on the left side and one vertical segment on the right side. There's one condition that n should be equal to some of the bi minus ai. That is something which guarantees that the do this domain is tileable. Otherwise, it's not. <clears throat> okay, so that's a domain. So we will trial this domain now. What is the probability measure that we introduce on tilings of this domain? So probability of each tiling will be proportional to the product of weights of the red lozenges, or if you want horizontal lozenges. And the weight of each lozenge will be given by this function here. So we will introduce vertical coordinate system, which we'll be calling the vertical coordinate will be X. And we will introduce two parameters, kappa and Q. And the weight of each red lozenge will be kappa times Q to the X <coughs> minus kappa inverse Q to the minus X. So that's a formula, right? It defines probability distribution. Now for each lozenge, for each tiling, you compute product of these weights. It's probability distribution. Now you can ask questions about this probability distribution. So, 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 so this just shows, okay, that this is where X is equal to minus nine. This is where it's equal to minus eight. This kind of illustrates what coordinate system. That's really, it's truly vertical coordinate system for the X. Right, so, so, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, so, 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 right, right, right. So, 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 so that, that is the true definition of X. So, you know, you, 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 you should think, yeah, that's correct that this, this, this horizontal line doesn't agree nicely with the grid structure. That's correct. So, so that, that really goes kind of in the orthogonal direction to the vertical thing. So it doesn't follow, you know, this line. It's literally as, as it is drawn on this picture. That, that's, that's. Uh, I mean, there is always like uh, the bottommost point, right? Oh yeah, it doesn't have to be at the center, right? Right? Like the top part is not symmetric, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now you know this measure has many interesting degenerations. So, for example, if you set q equals to one, then dependence on x disappears, and you can then absorb kappa and kappa inverse into normalization constant. So then it's just a uniform measure. So our old friend. If you send kappa to, to plus infinity, then what will happen is that in this formula on the first term will survive. So that will be weight Q to the X. And when you multiply Q to the X over all things here, then what's happening that the result is like measure Q to the volume. So it's kind of number of the cubes in this stepped, you know, in this body, which is underlying your, uh, your step surface, if you want, that this tiling is illustrating. So that's a uh, cap goes to infinity, that's measure Q to the volume, kappa goes to zero, then instead only the second term survives and the first one disappears. So you get measure Q to the minus volume. So you can say that this is some kind of interpolation between you know, Q to the volume and Q to the minus volume. One of them kind of uh, puts more weight on the high volume tilings and other puts more weight on low volume tiling and there is interpolation between these measures. Uh, if you send Q and kappa to one, and maybe divide this by Q minus one, then you will get something which will be, weight will become a linear function of X or the simplest possible thing. So there's quite a number of, you know, interesting cases which you get out of that. Now, one important comment here is that we want to speak about probability. So we will need this weight to be positive, right? So the weight of each tiling should be positive. So there are several ways how you can guarantee that things are positive because, okay, there is a subtraction here. First, you can assume that both Q and kappa are real numbers, and then there is some inequality, or maybe kappa is large enough so that everywhere inside your domain, this have the fixed sign. This will guarantee that everything is positive. Alternatively, you can think about kappa being purely imaginary number, in which case, you know, maybe 
uh, imagine that it's imaginary unit, then you know the sign will kind of change here and everything will become positive. Or there is also trigonometric case, so complex kappa and q, which will have a, a length one. This can also lead to positivity of this weight. So you need to think a little bit about positivity, but you know don't don't need to overthink about it now. Okay, so what is what is known about that? So for the specific domain for for the hexagon, there is something in which we start looking at maybe 13 years ago. At this point, for example, we had a a random sampler in the paper with Alexei Baradin and Eric Cranes. And here are some samples for these tilings of the hexagon for different values of Q and Kappa. Now the hexagon was studied in the subsequent years. So, you know, there's an interesting structure there related to Cura cartonal polynomials, which led to some attention to uh, this model, but it's only for hexagons. So there was like some low flush numbers and uh, bulk limit theorem for the hexagon. So kind of description on global scales of this picture. And then there was more recently some central limit theorem for global fluctuations describing how these, you know, the heights, how do they fluctuate on global scales. So that is something which was known, but beyond uh, hexagons, you know, before today, nothing was known. And that's kind of the point that I want to describe to you what's happening beyond hexagons for these, uh, you know, quite interesting probability distributions on tilings. <clears throat> okay, what kind of questions can you ask and what kind of questions can you answer about these tilings? So the first question is about Arctic boundaries here. So what does it mean? Well, imagine that your domain is huge or in other words, the mesh size of your lozenges is tiny. Then what you see immediately in simulation is that, you know, there are several, several phases here, right? So near the, borders of your domain, you see only one type of lozenges that is something what's called frozen region. And well, inside you see some kind of rough face where you see all type of, uh, all three types of lozenges and you know, something interesting is happening here. So naturally you might be wondering about the boundary of this frozen region where you will see only one type of uh, wasn't just so you know there are two questions here first you want to prove that this arctic boundary exists so we had many talks yesterday with the tangent method where people were discussing that and then you also want to find you know some formulas for this arctic curve which describes you know the point where the phase transition is happening in your picture so that's the first question that you might ask about these tilings so here is the answer so we deal with the uh, Again, trapezoids. So these trapezoids will scale with small parameter epsilon. So you should think just about drawing this trapezoid on the plane and then just tiling it with smaller and smaller lozenges. That's what's really happening. So the domain is kind of fixed, but the mesh size of the lozenges which you tile, they become smaller and smaller. So that can be in that way a polygon with arbitrary many sides. Okay, now our theorem tells that the curve you know, this frozen boundary has explicit uh, algebraic parameterization in a proper coordinate system. Namely, you know, to find this parameterization, you start with a function F0 here. So this function F0, that is a function which just kind of encodes inside all the parameters of the model. So, you know, A's and B's are entering into the product here. You know, T is also somewhere here and n is also somewhere here. But out of that, that is just a rational function of q to the u, right? So then some function encoding boundaries. Now out of this function, you create two more functions, u and v by some rational transformations of your function. And given all these, you know, parameterization in terms of these, uh, well, rational functions essentially, you have, uh, parameterization of your Arctic curve as well, just a curve in terms of the parameter of small u where, you know, T coordinate, which is now like that. So, you know, I made slight change of coordinate system now. So now T and X, they are not as before then, you know, X is not no longer being counted from the horizontal line is now counted from this sloped line because somehow it's more, com more convenient for our formulas. And then, okay, T and X, they're given by this kind of explicit thing. So, uh, Q to the T just rationally depends on everything. Okay, for Q to the X, you need to solve one quadratic equation. So there'll be one uh, square root. But other from that, everything is explicit in terms of these things. 
So that's the formula, right? So any questions about the statement of this theorem? What? Yeah, we, we will get to that, right? All right. So that, so that, that, that is just a first step, the, the, this Arctic boundary. But let's see, you know, I, of course, naturally you want to put it into your computer and see on this, uh, what are these uh, frozen boundaries? And that's what I did. So I have a program on Maple, which draws all that. So here are some pictures which I made for you. So, you know, that can get a variety of very nice pictures. So, you know, I could get a hand there, some maybe exotic flower there. About this picture, you know, different people have different opinions, what exactly is drawn here. So I will leave it to your imagination, what's there. And the next one is my favorite one. So you can have a nice animal if you rotate picture a little bit. <laughs> okay, so that's all comes out of those formulas. Mm -hmm. For our analysis, it's very crucial, right? So, so, so we don't know how to do anything. Like uh, uh, we need this Markov chain structure which will work, you know, we know how to produce the formula of Markov chain structure. You know, there's always Markov chain structure, but the type of Markov chain structure which we need to apply all this dynamical loop equation, it only, it is only obtained when there is only one segment on the, on the right side. So for now it's crucial, maybe in the future we can remove this obstacle. Okay, so the next thing is precisely the question that Pavel asked. So what about the full limit shape? Now, what does it mean limit shape? There are two ways to think about it. First, you know, as I mentioned, there is a height function there. So you can think just about the limit of this height function. Maybe after you rescale everything properly, this height function will converge to something deterministic. Other way to think about the same thing is just to say, okay, what if we just want to count how many lozenges are there in some particular part of the picture? then you expect that asymptotically the number of lozenges in some particular part of the picture will become deterministic after proper rescaling. So it might be given by integral of certain density of lozenges. And then you're trying to find what is this density of lozenges you know, in this part of picture or in that part of picture. In other words, you'd find to identify this limit shape, which is some function on, the, on your domain, which gives you asymptotic proportions of lozenges of three types at that particular part of your domain. So that's what we want to do. Now, there's a convenient tool here, which originally appeared in the work of Kenyon and Klinkov. So what they suggested is that, you know, it's kind of complicated to work with three real functions, uh, you know, which all, all should be non-negative and sum up to one, weird coordinate system. So they suggested to use different coordinate systems and all problems of this type, which is called complex slope. So for that, you renormalize your three density of lozenges, which sum up to one, multiplying them by pi. And then you think about these three numbers at three angles of a triangle. And you put this triangle with vertices at zero, one, and whatever is the third vertex. And in this way now, three proportions of lozenges become parametrized by a complex number in the upper half plane. But really this is just a change of coordinates. You know, once you have this number, you draw a triangle, you have three proportions, right? It's just a convenient, coordinate system to think about problems of this type. So if you want, now we want to find asymptotically this function f as a function of t and x. So we know already that it will be kind of trivial outside of this Arctic curve from the previous slide. So really we want to find it inside this Arctic curve. So what's, what's happening there? Okay, that is our next theorem. So <clears throat> the setting is the same. It's again, you know, this trapezoid with mesh size becoming smaller and smaller. And by the way, I probably I forgot to say that there's the name of my course. And there's a Jia Young Huang who is now at NYU. And next year he will be in the University of Pennsylvania. So this complex slope in the liquid region, because you know, outside the liquid region, there is nothing to study there. There's only one type of lozenges, nothing interesting. So in the liquid region, so in the region where you see all three types of lozenges, it can be found by solving certain equation. So first, you know, as before, you parameterize all your boundaries through exactly the same function f0, exactly the same function large u, exactly the same function v of u. Now the new ingredient is now there is an equation which you are solving here. So for if you are given a point x and t where you want to understand proportions of your three types of lozenges, that what you will do, you will solve an equation which is written here. So this equation, there is an equation on the variable u. So all other things are given to you. Okay, so all these A's and B's these are, these are boundaries. So X and T, there's a point where you're trying to understand something. 
And now there's an equation U. Well, after you clear the denominators, so it is just algebraic equation on, uh, well, maybe on Q to the U. So you solve this algebraic equation. Now, what will happen is that inside the liquid region, inside the region where you expect to see uh, something non-trivial, uh, this equation will have mostly real solutions, except for the four complex solutions, which will be all related to, uh, to each other. There'll be two in upper half plane, two in lower half plane. And uh, you know, there's some symmetry why there are four rather than two. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You take any of these solutions and now you do uh, some rational transformation here out of this solution. And they claim that the result is precisely your complex slope at your point. There is a procedure. So you solve algebraic equation and then you do rational transformation and then you get in complex slope, which encodes proportions of your laws and just well through these formulas, right? Through this triangle. Okay, so that's a theorem. So for that thing, I haven't drawn any pictures because it's kind of hard to draw in, <laughs> in, in high dimensions, but uh, any questions about this theorem? Right, right, right. So, 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 so you think about that, that you, know, you kind of fix maybe this domain and then mesh size becomes smaller and slower. So macroscopically, it's kind of the same polygon. So from far away, nothing changes. It's really only mesh size, which is changing. Okay. R, there's a number of these vertical segments on the left. So, so this picture R is equal to two, but, but it can be allowed to be any, any integer, whatever you like. Yeah, yeah, you, 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 you can do it only, you know, algebraicity will kind of disappear, right? So, so uh, this product, okay, you can take a logarithm of this product and then, you know, break span, okay, this will have well-defined limit. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, you, you will have, a, you know, the densities will have a square root type singularity. It's like, like in the semi, like in the Wigner semicircle law. Right, 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 right. So, 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 so what will happen is that outside the liquid region, uh, all solutions of the equation is actually real. And inside the liquid region, you have complex solutions. So the, the Arctic boundary, that's precisely the, part, the point where complex solutions kind of glue together. So, so you can find as a, some critical, critical point of these, uh, of these formulas, you can find previous formulas. That's correct. Okay. So corollary, that's an interesting corollary is that actually you can find a polynomial Q here in the liquid region, which somehow depends on your boundary condition. So that if you apply this polynomial to two rational expressions in terms of your complex slope, then this polynomial is zero. Uh, then the result is zero. In other words, you know, your limit shape is found or maybe encoded in terms of a single polynomial here. Well, for us, it is just a corollary of those explicit formulas there. So why if I, am I even mentioning that? Well, that's because we have a conjecture is that we prove this thing for these uh, trapezoids by the conjecture is actually same statement that, you know, that limit shape is parameterized in terms of a single polynomial in which you need to plug in these two types of variables. We expect this to be true for tilings of arbitrary polygons. Mm -hmm. In our case, we, we, we know the degree, but in, in general, uh, well, you need to compute it. So, uh, so for kappa equals to infinity case for the Q to the volume, generation, the generation of this model, that uh, was discovered by Kenyon and Kunkov. This, uh, oh, it should be Kenyon, sorry, typo here. <laughs> uh, that uh, there is this uh, algebraicity phenomenon that, you know, everything is encoded in terms of the polynomial. And, you know, in our case, it's still generalized for these more general measures on tiling. So we hope that this algebraicity is always true, but in terms of kind of this funny, rational transformations of the slopes, which you need to use here. In these situations, yes. So, so I mean, it depends on boundary conditions, but for these trapezoids that we work with, it's always connected. It will stick. So, so, so you, you, can, you can make it separate into two if you, 
uh, if you start wearing your Q, so if Q, if you say that Q was convergent to one here, you see that the epsilon times the logarithm of Q converges to something. So if you say that Q may be going slower to one, then you can force things to disconnect, but that's not something that we looked into. We will get to that, right, right, that, 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 that will appear. Okay, let, let me first, you know, before jumping to some tools, which Philippe is interested in, let, let me give you one last result. So you can also ask about height fluctuations. So namely this height function, which converges to deterministic thing, according to the theorem, which I mentioned to you just now, but you can also look what are the fluctuations around these limit shapes. So you look at the heights, which you find in terms of the walks, and you look at the limit of the height minus expectation of the height as the domain becomes large. So for the hexagon, here is uh, something that I drew for you. So for this 100 times 100 times 100 hexagon, so this is the field of these fluctuations of the height function. So you see that uh, here there are no fluctuations, really everything is completely flat, nothing interesting, but in the liquid region, you have interesting fluctuations. So you see that they're very rough, but on the other hand, you know, they're not super large, right? So here on the picture, maybe from minus two to two, that's the size of these fluctuations. So they're kind of reasonable and noted that there are no, there's no rescaling here. So really fluctuations will stay finite as epsilon goes to zero. Okay, so that's the next task to compute the asymptotic fluctuations of the centered heights. Yeah, that you will see in a second. Here, <laughs> Pavel is always one step ahead. <laughs> so uh, our theorem is that inside the liquid region, we have convergence of the centered height function to a certain field, G of Tx, which is a generalized centered Gaussian field. And this is a generalized centered Gauss field. And all you need to specify for this field is covariance structure. And covariance structure is given by this formula. So it's one over two pi times logarithm of you know, ratio. You know, when you compute covariance between two points, Tx and T prime X prime of the ratio of some values of some function, omega, which we'll be calling like complex coordinate. In this in this problem, and uh, okay, so this function that's essentially a, a green function in the upper half plane. If you want to connect to the objects that you know, and uh, you know the the most important thing is this map omega. So this map essentially comes from the same computations which we had in the limit shape. So remember that we had some u there which was coming out to solving some equation, and so now. You know, you just take this U and you do this quadratic transformation with this U and that's precisely uh, the coordinate system which you need to get your covariance in a simple form. Now this can have interpretation if you want. So interpretation would be that the fluctuations are given by the Gaussian free field. What is Gaussian free field? Well, Gaussian free field is an object which you can define on any complex manifold. So on the complex manifold, or maybe one dimensional complex manifold, you can introduce Laplace operator and then you can try to invert this Laplace operator. So inverse of the Laplace operator that will be integral operator with some kernel, Green's function. And then the, the kernel, you just say, okay, let's now create a Gaussian field whose covariance is given by this kernel. And that's what's called Gaussian free field. So it depends on the choice of the complex structure because you need to be able to define these uh, operators. So you need to introduce some complex structure in your in your problem, and it is not a usual complex structure of the plane. That is something interesting, which is always happening in this tilings problem, that the complex structure for the answers for the Gaussian free field, for the conformal invariant object, you know, you need to work to see this complex structure. And in our situation, that is given by, you know, either of these rational expressions, which appeared in this conjecture, which I was mentioning to you. But again, in our case of trapezoid, it's you know, really, we know explicitly all the parts here. Yeah, so, so convergence, you know, there is a generalized field. So you need to look at the uh, coupling as to, like a pairing with some test functions. So our test functions in certain coordinate systems that it will be, uh, they're forced to be analytic in the vertical direction. So in the horizontal direction, we can have anything, but our tools use some complex analysis because of that in the vertical direction, we need to have analytic test functions. <clears throat> Okay, so again, uh, you know, there is a conjecture that you know these Gaussian free field asymptotics is actually true for arbitrary domains. Uh, interesting thing about this conjecture is that that is even not known for a uniform measure. So even for a uniform measure, there's still maybe 
the last major, maybe not the last, but at this point, you know, maybe the most important major question, which is not known about uniformly random tiling that you always have Gaussian free field there, but you know, for our trapezoids, we have this. Well, I mean, it's quite general, but you see that on the right side, we are forced to have only one vertical segment, right? So it's in that sense, you know, there is still some restriction. It's not, you know, you can draw polygon, which will not look like that. <clears throat> okay, now, you know, all these results, I believe that new for these Q kappa distributions on tilings, and even actually for the Q to the volume distributions on tilings, it wasn't done previously, but for the uniform measure, of course, there was a huge literature. You know, I needed to have some material for my book. So, you know, <laughs> there, was, there was a literature there. So uh, this rational parameterization of the Arctic curve for Q equals to one, that was figured out by Petrov eight years ago. The fact that limit shapes should be described by algebraic equations in wider generality, it's Kenyon and Kunkov result, but then for the trapezoid, there are the results of Petrov and Deuce Metcalf for uniform measure and Gaussian free field also, there are like three different methods how you can find it for the uniform measure. But again, the whole point is that we go beyond the uniform measure in this talk. Okay, so maybe I have like, like five minutes. Yeah, five minutes. Okay, so in five minutes, I will try to give you a glimpse into the proofs. So what, are, what makes it possible for us to analyze these things? First, there is the first bit of integrability, which is the fact that in this situation, partition function is explicit. So there's normalization constant in the, all the probability measures. So here is a statement. So if you draw a trapezoid, and now we'll parameterize it in a slightly different way. So I will parameterize it by the red lozenges on the left-hand side, instead of these AI and BIs, which were corresponding more to the uh, green and blue lozenges. Then it turns out that the sum of all uh, weights of the lozenge tilings over this domain is given by the explicit product formula. That's uh, the formula here. So that was originally, this formula was discovered in our paper with uh, uh, Alexi and Eric uh, 15 years ago. There, we just did some advanced determinantal evaluations to get it. Well, more recently, it was realized that actually that is connected to some uh, properties of some symmetric polynomials, then <laughs> you need to use kuhn winder symmetric polynomials and something called quasi branch rule and principal specializations. For those who know a little bit about symmetric polynomials, you can notice, okay, that looks like maybe a formula for the principal specialization of sure polynomials because you have a product over i, i, I slower than j of some differences. That's what kind of things which appear in this poly symmetric polynomial business. So maybe you're not surprised that it's related to something, but the you know, the important polynomials here are these cool minor polynomials. Okay, so we have partition functions. Once you have partition function, you can identify mark of chain structure in your problem. So you draw these paths by ignoring the red lozenges and looking into blue and green lozenges. And then you trace, you know, what's happening with the particles in your path according to your uh, probability measure. So that, you know, computing this pro transition probability of this mark of chain reduces to several computations of the partition function, which you do by the previous step. And then you get in precisely the form that I announced at the very beginning. That's the form which we can analyze this you know, kind of ratio of two Vandermonds with a particular choice of these two over parameters. So theta will be equal to one. So this B function, okay, this quadratic expression and this phi plus and phi minus something encoding the right boundary. So you match the through the form to which we knew how to do something. Okay, now you apply our holomorphic observable. That's the thing which we started from. Now you just do kind of small mesh size expansion of this holomorphic observable and you play some tricks with contra integrals, which is what holomorphicity allows you. And eventually you find that, you know, decomposing this, you find that the time increment in your Markov chain has a form, there's some deterministic drift, plus some Gaussian stochastic part, and plus some small error. And eventually the deterministic drift will lead to the limit shape. And this Gaussian stochastic part eventually will lead to the Gaussian free field fluctuations. So that's a next step of our thing. Okay, so we got there's some kind of abstract theorem. Whenever you have something of this form, you can get asymptotic expansions with this type of terms. Now, you know, you have some, in this way, you're getting some evolution equation because you're saying, because it was all about one step of our Markov chain. So in one step, you have this deterministic part and Gaussian part, but then you need to kind of glue together all these time steps. So in other words, you're getting certain nonlinear evolution equation here, 
And you need to solve this nonlinear evolution equation, getting the explicit formulas, which I showed to you there. So this still takes significant amount of efforts, but let me just give you one idea, which is important in our analysis. So this complex slope, which I was mentioned to you previously, you know, in the work of Kenyon and Kunkov, for example, this complex slope was appearing because in terms of this complex slope, you know, there was nice equation, which they were calling complex Burgers equation. Now, the problem with that complex Burgers equation and the problem in the work of Kenyon and Kunkov was the fact that, well, this equation was only true in the liquid region. So only where you see all three types of proportions of lozenges, there you get something meaningful, but in the frozen region, you have nothing, but a priori, you don't know where is the liquid region and where is frozen region. And so this makes it complicated because you don't know, you know, you don't have a starting point. And uh, well, we also had this problem. So we overcome that by introducing additional dimension in this problem. Namely, we made analytic continuation of our complex slope from, you know, in the vertical coordinate, we had some real parameterization and we make analytic extension to make it complex. So from this complex slope being a function of, you know, two real parameters, we made it a function of one real and one complex parameter. And then magically the problem that, uh, uh, that, you know, you'd need to know where, what is frozen and what is liquid disappeared because now we moved away to the complex plane and there nothing is ever frozen. And then we managed to apply some complex analysis there. And eventually, you know, our nonlinear uh, equation became much simpler if we looked through this nonlinear equation along the characteristic flow of certain first order partial differential equation, which is kind of a relative of the complex Burgers equation. But like for the complex Burgers equation, usually, you know, you don't have this, you know, right hand side. And the new feature there is this right hand side, which controls in homogeneities, but essentially, you know, many things are encoded in terms of this equation. Okay, so my time seems to be almost over. So let me conclude with a summary. So what we saw there, okay, there is this, you know, dynamical loop equation for quite general uh, Markov chains. Oh, there was data somewhere there, which was emitted, sorry. So we have this equation, expectation of some observable is holomorphic, and then we are made, able to apply it to a variety of models in particular, applying it to these Q-couple lozenge tilings, we have parameterized Arctic curve, algebraic limit shapes, and Gaussian free field type fluctuations. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vadim, for a very interesting talk. I'm sure we had already some questions during the talk, but maybe there are more questions. Yes, Philip. Is there any mapping or, well, maybe mapping is too much, but is there any relation to the five vertex model? Like viewing the, no. the lozenge styling within the context of six no, vertex model? Not, not that I'm aware about. No, I, I don't really know. Okay, there's a standard way of transforming the, the local configuration. I mean, the, the, but... there should be, right? So, so... Yeah. no, but I don't know. I mean, for, for us, for a while, you know, the fact that we, the fact that the hexagon was solvable for a while, that was a mystery for us because, you know, wh why did it work with this homogeneous way? Then we, you know, recently what, what was realized that it is just, you know, corresponds to kind of generalization from series A to, you know, this different root system BC. Now, so, so you're asking me how the correspondence between uh, kind of this symmetric polynomials and vertex model, how does it generalize from series A to series BC? And I would think that it should uh, generalize, but you know, I, I'm not ready to write down formulas for you. But I, I was thinking be... of something simpler, like your new weight uh, of horizontal uh, tiles uh, right. seems to be carrying some spectral parameter or is, is there a way of thinking of it in a more standard integrable way somehow? Well, I, I kind of don't know because you see, you know, our way, the whole point is that it changes, right? It changes as you move around. Like in the vertex models, usually you want to have something homogeneous. So the question is, is there some way to maybe rewrite it in a vertex model, which will become more homogeneous? Maybe, but, you know, at this point, I don't know. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, that's possible. Uh, any more questions? 
doesn't seem to be the case. So thank you. And uh, the <laughs>